different applications, you have, you pay attention to what can, okay? Then you saw that mature analytical instruments, they have all kinds of readouts. And the key Einstein there is that they have independent variables that give you that performance to be more selective than our conventional sensors. Okay? So those analytical instruments are categorized as uh, zero order, first order, second order, higher ones, depending on how many independent variables you have. Okay? Uh, the higher the order of your instrument, the better the uh, ability to reject the not only known, but also unknown interferences. Okay? Those analytical instruments who were big, <coughs> we don't want or we want, they get smaller without us present. Right? So they're very good and uh, we really uh, have uh, certain things that we can contribute as the sensing community to that and uh, uh, we are inspired by these types of uh, uh, achievements in, uh, in those instruments as well. Okay? So existing gas sensors, these are the zero order instruments. Right? So they have no independent variables and therefore uh, they are very good at detecting things at rel relatively large concentrations where you are not afraid that something else will compete for the signal. If something else competes, well, you even don't. Because in those nature articles, and you were make, uh, uh, mentioning ozone, they were saying that response to interferences is about one order, maybe six times more stronger than the response to analytics. Okay? So, for a graduate student, it doesn't matter. But if somebody is taking asthma medication, or doesn't, it matters. If somebody is closing the road or brings somebody in court based on that, that's in that article. It also matters. So uh, there are things that we need to, uh, to, pay, to pay attention to. And uh, so these are the uh, take, uh, take home 10 uh, messages. But basically, and, and some other ones, and my last one is. Uh, that uh, accuracy needs to be improved, and uh, I'm thinking that uh, that's a nice segue to, to go to that second topic that is uh, sensory. So before I, I'm turning it on, so do we have any questions on this? Okay, so. Knowing all the details about analytical instruments and sensors are part of that. So what can we do next to improve the selectivity aspect? Okay. So, Krishna uh, Prasad, he shows in uh, 1982 that if you combine several sensors into uh, an array with the conventional or data analysis, that is looking at uh, all the sensors together, then you are improving that selectivity big time. And there are more and more examples of that, the whole field of uh, sensory studies where you have 10 and 100 and 300 and uh, 65,000 elements in the array because it does help selectivity okay? big time. And uh, conventional individual sensors, one of the calls that I've heard from uh, my colleague is a sensor selectivity is a lost battle, and I will say, yeah, for, for the zero order instrument, I, I agree with you, unless you are at the zenith. So that's why we come with the sensor rays or our multi variable sensor. So sometimes you see that electronic nodes as well. I will discuss that in, in a second. So, except, yes, sir. So you know, are these all the same identical sensors? Uh, well, very often yes, but uh, um, not always, because uh, there were uh, results shown by uh, by uh, Ted Zellers and others where you have multiple transducers of different uh, readout met 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 methods, and you 
combine them into array, then your performance improves. That performance is called dispersion. And uh, that dispersion thing of the sense array improves. Yes. So they can be either individual, uh, same transducer principle or different. But the sensor system with the sensor array or electronic also, it has the way to bring the sample to the sensor. Then it has different sensing materials because by design we would like to take advantage of those bar graphs now, right? Then you have different types of transducers. You pick either one type or, as you can see from this graph, different ones. And you do data processing to identify what it is and also to see what concentration it is. Okay. So the reason that I use the word electronic nodes is to understand that this term is applied to not only the sensor as the device that we were talking about, but also to anything that at the end has the data analysis part and can be used uh, to discriminate between uh, orders of flavors and stuff, and not necessarily a sensor element as we have it in our uh, definition. It can be a gas chromatography instrument, or it can be IMS instrument coupled with the data analysis tools. Okay, so uh, these terminologies, and even Agilent instrument, with mass spec was called chemical sensor, and it's okay once you know the definition and you don't argue with them because that's their definition. Okay, so data analysis is a important part. So these days, this year, there are uh, sensor arrays that are, for example, from AirSense, very small, uh, then from uh, uh, VaporSense company, very small, uh, nanofiber based, and uh, also uh, uh, in, uh, I think, uh, in, in Korea, I saw a very nice uh, example of a uh, uh, sensor array for uh, uh, ambient monitoring in uh, uh, indoor environments. And uh, from data analysis, the methods that are used for conventional sensor, uh, for conventional instrumentation, they are also used for uh, sensor arrays and also for multivariable sensors. And uh, they are to uh, do the analysis either in unsupervised approaches where you have the data, you are not touching any anything and it gives you the uh, information what you are interested in or supervised you need to have some inputs and uh, uh, another aspect of uh, data analysis if, uh, if uh, it provides you either the clusters or discrimination between the papers or quantifies it. Okay. So, um, if needed, we can go through uh, more details of that, but I'll show you a couple of examples only. Uh, uh, the reason that I'm showing an example of uh, principal components analysis is because for sensor arrays, it's uh, probably 90% of uh, uh, all the examples from uh, commercial instruments and from uh, research instruments come from uh, uh, analysis using PCA. So what uh, PCA is, is a very uh, straightforward uh, rotation of coordinates, I would say, in a uh, um, uh, uh, couple of times in order to project your original responses into a new image. Okay. So if you have a response, it can be a response of multiple sensors in that uh, array, or it can be uh, a response of a multivariable sensor or from some uh, analytical instrument, you do two rotations. So one rotation is that from this response, you're rotating it in such a way that it becomes a line. Okay? Good. And after that, that line, you rotate again, and you're done. When you rotate it, that line again, then that line projects into a single point in that new dimension. Okay? Why you are doing it? Because if you are doing this rotation and those two points now are touching each other, right? Like here, these are examples. Then that means that your sensor is not sensitive enough because you're increasing the gas concentrations and the response is not.
strong enough to, to be different. But if they are spread like this, then different papers produce different features that was difficult to catch first. So that's an example of uh, uh, high selectivity because it separates well. And sensitivity is not as good because the spread is not wrong. The sensitivity is nice when the spread is larger because these are the different gas concentrations. But selectivity is not good because they're not spread uh, between the columns. And this is an example where the spread goes in different directions and uh, the uh, concentrations are also giving the responses uh, higher and higher. So that gives you the ability to discriminate different papers and their concentrations. So you see that this is a two-dimensional graph because now it's called a 2D dispersion. But if you don't have that, that spread, then you cannot discriminate those papers. So now you have a two-dimensional dispersion of your sensor. And uh, the more dispersions or di uh, dimensions you have for that spread, the more capabilities of your sensor array you have to discriminate different papers and uh, reject things that you don't like. So the higher dispersion of your sensor system, the better your response. Now, the word dispersion and uh, order of instruments is slightly different because you're reaching the dispersion after your multivariate analysis. Because in the very beginning, your sensor array is a first order instrument no matter what. Okay? But if you have good sensing materials that will have the different responses, slightly different, then you can have it uh, a chance for that good dispersion. So um, we were doing sensor arrays for some time. We uh, started to do multivariate sensors um, about 10 years ago. But we see examples from, from our work on uh, different sensor arrays. And uh, um, what you do first, you, you have a pattern of the responses of your different channels. So this is your first order system. And for a response, these are the responses for six different volatiles. So these volatiles come from the fact that these are the chlorinated uh, volatiles that naturally break down to smaller and smaller fractions and they become trichloroethylene and uh, uh, isomers of dichloroethylene and vinyl chloride. So they, they get smaller and smaller and then they become non-toxic. Okay? So uh, if we're measuring these volatiles with a sensor array, for four elements in the sensory. So these are the individual vapors. Then, for this volatile, we have that pattern of these four sensors like this. For other volatile, <coughs> slightly different pattern, slightly different. So the different patterns, they help us in getting that two-dimensional graph. Okay. So here we're showing that we have our two dimensions when we have our six volatiles that we were detecting, these are not mixtures. Not mixtures. Okay? So, example of uh, <coughs> uh, detecting uh, several gases, but now you see the dispersion is bigger, so that's a three-dimensional dispersion. So you have bigger sensor array, you have 10 sensors in your array, and now you push the responses to those volatiles into different planes in your 3D uh, representation. Six guesses. Okay. So now uh, that's another example from Caltech. Now, so now you have 17 sensors in your array, and now you have nine guesses, and uh, uh, you can push the responses. This is PC5 or uh, direction five. So you can have five, five, uh, five uh, dimensions. So. By analogy, you, you, you're getting a feeling that, hey, the more elements you have in the sensor kind of gives you more spread, and the more vapors you, you test will, you, will also give you more spread if your sensing materials are diverse, okay? which, is, which is you are on the right track. Now, so this is an example from a dosimeter system where 
by design, those are, are elements with their stronger interactions, so they are more irreversible, so the selectivity is a little more or very more. And uh, here, the example is you have six, uh, 36 elements or sensors in your array, and you were sniffing not five, not six, but uh, almost 20 guesses, all right? And now your dimensionality becomes you are about, you have nine dimensions of your dispersion, okay? So the more elements you have, the more guesses you have, and uh, if they're slightly different, then it helps you in uh, getting to this type of uh, display. When you have higher dispersion, it gets you more ability to reject interferences. So I will show you this a uh, couple of slides with a very small font. We're not reading anything on that. The reason that I'm showing you that is um, two slides are from nice review uh, by, by my colleagues, uh, I said, uh, not a century, a decade ago, okay? And uh, uh, you see that these sensors, uh, or sensor uh, arrays or electronic nose things, so they have gas chromatography coupled with soil devices, they have uh, uh, ion mobility spectrometry coupled with uh, other type of things and so on. So it's a combination of classical sensors as we know them with um, uh, with the uh, first order instruments that are more classic analytical instruments. The continuation of that table also shows more examples of uh, ion mobility spectrometry, uh, ion mobility spectrometry, field asymmetric ion mobility. So these are examples of, of these devices. So, a uh, couple of years ago, the table, this one, includes conducting polymers, uh, some uh, metal oxide sensors, and um, nice examples of, uh, of uh, manufacturers. My two last tables uh, to uh, highlight what are the analytical tools that uh, people use. And um, for quantitation and qualitative information, so as I mentioned, ECA is one of the most pronounced ones. So, after all the conducting polymer based sensors you discussed, the commercial sensor, are they resistive based or optical based? They're, they're not optical based. I think if I remember, because all of them are my favorites. Okay. Um, I think they must be on resistance chain okay. So, the term conducting polymer has two meanings. So, one meaning is a conjugated polymer, yeah. okay? And the second meaning is a dielectric polymer with, meta uh, with uh, conducting fillings such as carbon black yeah. or whatever, okay? okay. So, uh, in 2008, there were nice example of true conduct conjugated polymers, and uh, those were nice systems where you have a sample, you condition it by having the right temperature, right humidity, and then you automatically, with your robot, whatever, you pre present it to your enos. Okay? And uh, you probably calibrate that enos before. So, if something happens with your conjugated polymer, you correct it for that before you make it. Okay? So, uh, this table, for example, shows Silano Sciences. This is classical uh, sensor array from Nathan Lewis. And these are their resistive sensors. These are 32 of those. And these are uh, the electric polymers with carbon glass. So, uh, to my best knowledge, I think other ones are also non-optical non regards. Okay, so these are examples of um, uh, data analysis tools, all right, a couple of examples, and uh, more examples of data analysis tools. And uh, uh, if you do the mixtures, this is nice simulations from uh, Ted Zellers from uh, Michigan, then you have, in, and this is the PCA plot, okay, Two dimensions for now for the discussion. And you have individual guesses A, B, and C. You have binary mixtures A and B, 
and then we have ternary mixture in the middle. Nice. Then, if you, for example, have different carbon nanotubes materials, then remember I was mentioning that everything here was measured at 1 ppm of uh, gas concentrations. So everybody who was at 1 ppm, water vapor, this uh, chemical warfare agent, and that's how you are able to uh, maybe do that detection. And uh, when water vapor in air, say 50% humidity, the ppm numbers of water vapor will be 15,000, right? At uh, slightly higher humidity, it will be even more. So that bar will be 15,000 times more. So that thing will be somewhere in Alaska or whatever. And that thing will be distorted, and uh, that will be a big change. <laughs> Look at this. That's the answer problem. Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. When you do this mixture, this is very busy. So like when you do the constant measurements, oh, suppose I have gas in and gas in. Do you pass both gas at the same time? It's a mixture. So the answer is yes. I have a question, people. So are we to stop at 12? 30. 30. Oh, okay. Thanks, God. Okay, I'll answer you. Okay. So mixtures means you mix physically. Either five gases or two gases. Yeah. So the are that you should that is all gases present at the same time. Yes. The what? All gases are present at the same time. Then it's short of all gases. No, 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 no. I was keep on saying individual vapors. This is the first graph of mixture. All others were individual vapors. I was saying that. Okay? And I was saying that these are individual vapors. Now I will show you examples of mixtures. And uh, in our set, third section, it will be more mixtures. So mixtures are different. But before, they were individual vapors. Question. So what you plot, I'm sorry that I may have been added to you, plot the output signals of your sensors in the array, um, what you measure during applying first was only raw, raw gases, and now we, are, we have a two gas mixture, and now we have two principal components of the sensor output array, which is present in the chain. So what you illustrate here on this slide. Okay, so this particular example shows that you, dis you can discriminate two volatiles from breath to identify those markers. Okay? If you are in dry air, then with your carbon nanotube sensor array, you discriminate them mathematically very nice. <coughs> Signal to noise is nice, they do not overlap. When you mix those with the humidity, you see 80%, in, in, in breath it's 100%. 80% is a good, good stop. Okay, then they got overlapped so much that if I remove color, I'm screwed. I don't know what it is, right? So humidity competes for those binding sites, and it wins because 15,000 ppm or whatever of humidity is more than 10 ppb or 1 ppm of something else that I want to detect. So that becomes a, a big challenge, and that's why I put this slide again. You saw it. Because it says, hey, if I'm carbon nanotube, commercially, that was a nice sensor for moisture measurements. <coughs> so if we need to have this type of a sensing material, because it's a room temperature operated, perhaps you can functionalize it and so on, then there should be more, I would say, non obvious technical solutions on how to functionalize them. Or think, well, there are other materials. Do I need to get married to these carbon nanotubes or, or not? It, it depends really on the direction of, of the research, of personal interest, of Anything. So that's why it's hard to say should we 
use them or should we not? Make sense? Yes. So how, how do you deal with nonlinearities in your sensor responses if you're using PCA? So the PCA is for for uh, clustering or for uh, analysis for no, not for quantitative analysis, okay? A lot of times. But uh, there are nonlinear um, algorithms that people use in combination with PCA because you do pattern recognition and then you do your nonlinear regressions. Like uh, locally weighted regression was applied here. Uh, we and others, I don't know others, but we try to stay away from high order fits because it, it, it becomes very unstable, so we stay away. So second order, third at most, and uh, uh, in uh, non-gas non sensors, say for accelerometers or for whatever, people go to fifth order polynomials and they're happy. We try to stay away from, from something that's higher than a third order. But uh, uh, the tools that people use more and more uh, will be support vector machine and other tools from um, uh, from machine learning where nonlinearities are uh, used, but they're they're pretty uh, robust and stable uh, transfer functions. So we we saw what happens when the concentration of uh, water vapor can be high, and uh, that's how it distorts the response in the uh, uh, lab measurements and um, uh, from the long-term stability perspective, this uh, small uh, size font table shows that testing were done uh, over six months, maybe 12 months of uh, stability of different sensing materials. And what happens, this is our simulated data that we, we showed some time ago, is that by, de by design, those sensing materials must be slightly different from each other. If they're same, boring, there will be no dispersion in that blue. So if they're slightly different, then they will age also slightly different. And because they're independent, that aging thing is an independent error, and when you sum them, then you take a square of that, then you sum them, take the square root, and then the more elements in an array you have, if you have a little sensor trick, then it adds up, and uh, the more elements you have, the more loss of your uh, or your prediction error grows so quickly. And uh, if you are looking at the probability of false alarms, these are things called rock curves, then your predicting ability with more elements in the array becomes less and less nice over time. So what happens is that as a community, we understand that uh, these types of um, diverse sources of uh, aging and uh, noise uh, uh, sources in the individual sensor elements, they become very challenging thing to solve. Okay? And then when we listen to end user people from, uh, from these years, they say, well, you need to improve specificity and long-term stability that's 2013, then drift-free sensors uh, need to be invented, okay? Then, well, if you would like to have those uh, things for accurate uh, applications for general public, you need to have this performance capability. So stability is also... So these are uh, end users from uh, food and breath uh, measurements and uh, from... Uh, other types of uh, environments where you would like to have a portable instrument, okay? And um, we as a community, we started to pay attention to stability very soon after the first sensor arrays were invented in 1982. And, uh, uh, you know, 10 years later, we were saying we need to improve stability. And after that, we were saying we need to improve stability, and we're saying well, uh, it looks like we, we're kind of, we're trying a lot and uh, we need to do something. So I put this graph, look. So 
So it's a weird graph because it doesn't have labels. But uh, uh, over time, the performance gets <coughs> saturated, and then you switch to something, and then you saturate again, and then you switch, and then you saturate. So if I will <coughs> show you what it is, I guess like that. That's the world records of how people jump. Okay, when I was in high school, I was using this tool, scissors, right? Okay, I'm very good at it. But I cannot jump very high, so uh, more and more different methods were invented. And this Fosbury flow is the method where it gives the best performance. Okay, so that actually is this guy on, on YouTube, we're not listening to, to the YouTube thing here, but he is the person who one person invented the method that is better than other methods. Okay? So what I'm saying here is that this iteration of performance is uh, observed in many industries or fields. Uh, if you're using some catalysis, then you also need to improve that different catalysis to, uh, to do other things. For sensors, we were using uh, human sensors, the birds, then we invented individual sensors, okay? Then the, then the sensor rays, and now we need to think how can we take all that knowledge that we have. We're not trying to start from scratch because that's, from my perspective, it's not uh, productive uh, and smart. So we need to take advantage of all that knowledge of existing sensors and see what can we do next to uh, outperform the um, current scenario. So that's why we are working on uh, uh, different types of uh, multivariate variable sensors. Okay. So our learnings from this segment. Okay. So system reliability was uh, identified as a top priority. Okay. For different applications. So uh, arrays of partially selective uh, sensor elements were validated in many practical applications and um, for the short-term uses they were quite uh, happy performers. The electronic nose term includes not only devices that we know as sensors but also the other types of devices so we need to keep that in mind. Okay? So our arrays is first order elements or sensor systems and the dispersion is coming after the data analysis. Okay? So, PCA is the most commonly used methodology. Dispersion is the key metric because it gives you that flavor on how good you discriminate. Okay. Um, sensor rates were demonstrated with uh, up to 65 sensor elements and uh, they have different materials. Over time, they independently change. Okay. And that becomes something that we as the community are trying to correct for, and uh, my number 10 is uh, saying that users are asking or requesting or demanding to get rid of this stability problem. And uh, um, so we are answering uh, their uh, calls, and I would say we'll switch to the uh, next section. Uh, section 3, and um, uh, these uh, demands or requirements, they can, if, if we meet them, then we can apply them in many, many, many applications. And uh, uh, if we see what are the drivers for that, that's uh, uh, ranging from environmental and health and uh, uh, home and industrial safety, and there are many trends, and uh, if you see that those Trends are typically focusing on uh, accuracy, accuracy, power, cost, accuracy again, and uh, these are the demands that we hear from uh, from the users. Okay, so we were talking that reliability uh, or long-term stability means many things. So uh, from days to years to hundreds of years, power consumption also means many things. It can be zero if you are in the power harvesting mode, or if you are wired and you are in a 
indoor applications than watts or milliwatts is not your problem. And for the sub -sub -C monitoring for less than one kilowatt, you're on the uh, on the heavy side of those users because they don't care. You are more than uh, one kilowatt is a lot. Cross sensitivity. Um, you see that those photoionization detectors are very popular because there are applications where all volatiles are of importance to measure, no matter what it is. If you would like to discriminate them, then you need to come up with some <coughs> solutions. If you have only expected leaks, that's uh, a lot of sensors are available. Um, for methane detection, like you were asking, uh, thermogenic versus biogenic methane is something that people are interested because thermogenic is the artificial from uh, gas production, biogenic are the cows, the forest and stuff. So uh, EPA is interested in thermogenic and uh, uh, it's important to discriminate different types of okay? uh, The challenge in uh, detecting biomarkers in breath because the levels of um, uh, uh, interferences are high and uh, and uh, that's uh, something that uh, people are working on. Cost, I'll use that word again for a little bit because for food safety, um, labels should be very cost effective, so less than a cent or so, right? For the subsea sensors, if it is $100,000, you're fine. But it should not break because if it breaks, you send the ship to repair. And the ship is $700,000. Make your freaking sensor. <laughs> you don't want to send the ship. Yeah, and that's the and they say please. If you need hundred thousand, ten thousand dollars per sensor, fine. If you need one kilowatt, fine. Just don't make us to send the ship. So yes. when you make this uh, sensor list, uh, for example, you, you you talk about variable sensors. You make a variable sensor array, you can only have so many sensors, right? Because of the size of the Apple Watch, you can't, probably cannot fit more than four sensors, right? So, what do you, how do you talk about the cost for performance, right? Right. So, that's why this segment is about the single sensor, where it is not an array. It is better than array, but it's a single sensor. So, mm -hmm. it's not four sensors. Single sensor, we are looking at, but it's a single sensor. No, but you say that for cost sensitivity, it is we, we, we win. It is better if you use yeah. it. No, it's not. We show here that it is as good or better. It's weird, that's why we have this discussion, so everybody kind of contributes on what to do next. And there are examples of. Uh, of that, because what we learned, we learned that those things are first order instruments. We learned that the dispersion matters. So I will show you examples how we are, how we are better than sensor in the single sensor. Single. Okay. So so if we have the complex mixture, then we saw that mature technologies spread these responses in different dimensions. We saw that conventional sensors, they don't spread. Sensor arrays, they spread probably like this, but they are not stable. So what I'm saying is that individual sensors that have multiple outputs, they are as good as this one. So what is it? So we have a transducer that has not one output, but several outputs. Okay? And we have a sensing material that will make the transducer happy because it will have independent responses to different guesses. Okay, so the sensing material has, should have uh, preferentially different response mechanisms. And then we also have, I call it microsystem, because we also learn, and I would like us to get excited about that, is that excitation of that transducer is something that we can play with. Why? because we can modulate that response in such a way that it gives us more multivariate juice or, or uh, performance. And then analytics, um, 
I would say um, not all data analysis methods are created equal, and uh, some of them are better than others. But raw data is very important to have high quality. So, uh, but data analytics uh, helps, but uh, it needs to be fed with the high quality data. So, sensing material that has multiple response mechanisms, transducer that has multiple outputs, and then that excitation uh, modulation. So, similarly, when we look at these errors, then from simulations we see that if we have a single multivariable sensor, then it affects much less in terms of a growing error as a function of sensor. So our dream is, and we're working towards that, is that it will be, when it's aged, it's as good as fresh. Okay? So that's our punchline, because we, we are developing methodologies how to correct for these effects in such a way that no matter uh, how much it's got uh, aged, it still is good. So that becomes a big differentiating point between the sensor rays and sensor, because when all of them are just calibrated, all of them are beautiful. Next day, things can change. And our vision is that we are as good as the age ones. Okay? Now, so, we use multivariable sensors as a term, okay? And in the R, there are synonyms for that. And um, very nice work goes, Krishna Prasad was one of the people who was using this type of concepts as well. This is the paper from 97, and uh, you see people call them intelligent sensors, multi-parameter, high order, multi-dimensional, virtual, virtual, and so on. So these are the synonyms for this type of things. Okay? So um, I would say, although the first things, papers were 97, 2000, and so on, so, uh, I think these days, <coughs> because the improvements for the sensor rates is slowing down, are slowing down, so uh, we are kicking more uh, power and uh, um, efforts in uh, uh, improving the selectivity of, uh, and stability of the individual sensors, and um, that's how we uh, progress. So this table shows that there are many uh, sensing materials that have the different types of responses that are useful for our transducer like that. So there are the electric polymers, conjugated ones, carbon nanotubes, fullerenes, and the, uh, on this side, uh, monolayer protected nanoparticles with different ligands, uh, of course, uh, supra molecular materials, porphyrins, <laughs> morphs, and so on. So, this is a nice list of uh, uh, sensing materials that is useful to apply onto transducers. And uh, if we look at those images, there is nothing that we haven't seen before. Okay? Not, not. All, all we see is that, well, I'm into the dedicated uh, electrode, and uh, I'm a, a resonator because I'm an electrode with an uh, inductor in it, I'm photonic. Uh, crystal sensors or some uh, uh, other structures. I'm a crystal binder balance or I'm a surface acoustic weight device. I'm an electrical field uh, effect transistor. And uh, <coughs> what researchers were doing, they were getting more multivariate juice by looking at the responses in the way that uh, they were doing in those uh, uh, published results. Okay? So, I make this slide to show that uh, software does help where um, uh, we have the good data. And uh, for consumer products, you can uh, use the software to uh, do the zoom in, digital uh, um, other controls. Uh, you can use AI for the face recognition. And uh, for some cars, they even have the software tricks to improve their car performance just by pressing the button and uh, then you're going to some sports mode or some, uh, some other mode, okay? So on the web, there are many uh, tools, and these days uh, they're called machine learning, 
before they were called data analytics or multivariate statistics. But there are many tools that uh, we can put in alphabetical order or any other order. And uh, from these tools, some of them are more proactively used for multivariate analysis uh, from multivariable sensors. That's a list of those. The description of these uh, methods is uh, in this table. That's from a uh, couple of years ago uh, article. And uh, it shows that these are the same tools that people are using for sensor arrays. So not much uh, of the uh, new tools, and we should expect probably new tools for that. So if we ask ourselves, what is the kind of compilations of uh, reported results based on different transducers, then we can show that if we're looking at photonic impedance ones, electromechanical uh, electro, uh, ones such as those PCM resonators and source structures, to the fat ones and so on, these are broken by this uh, dispersion. Okay, so two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. So you see that there are examples of up to four dimensions with uh, impedance for photonic sensors, field the fat transistors have uh, up to three dimensions. So you kind of have a feeling of uh, what to expect from different transduction principle applications. And uh, uh, when we do the mixtures, right, uh, then uh, this is the system to do uh, multi-channel mixing if the gases are non-toxic and uh, uh, we, we use them outside the hood. If uh, the gases are toxic, then we're sitting in the hood because uh, it's either explosive or uh, toxic. If we want to go to the very low concentrations, then we use cremation tubes for volatiles, and uh, that's an example of a system like that. And uh, uh, if we are graduating to uh, environmental testing and uh, stability testing, then we are sitting in the environmental chamber under the computer control in order to see how things are going as a function of temperature and so on. So. Um, uh, we can uh, tune and operate our system with all kinds of uh, flow profiles, steps, sine waves, you name it. And uh, our typical flow rates are 200 uh, uh, cubic centimeters, maybe up to 500 cubic centimeters uh, uh, a minute. Or, uh, yes, um, because we don't want to have too low flow rate and too high so we will not run out of our gases. And importantly, we keep our flow cells as little as possible in that volume. So we can have a fast response time because if we have a big chamber, then to change the gas in the chamber will be much longer than the response time of our sensors. So I'll show you examples from literature of individual gases first and then mixtures, and then modulations. And uh, I'll show you examples first from two-dimensional or two-dimensional dispersions, okay? So here you look at the uh, capacitance and resistance of your sensing film, okay? So two dimensions. Here you look at the also uh, conductivity and capacitance of your <coughs> carbon nanotubes, okay? So here, again, you're looking at conductance and capacitance of uh, 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 indium oxide, uh, metal oxide sensing material. So nice examples of two-dimensional dispersion where you simply look at capacitance versus resistance or conductance. You can also look at uh, different resonators. And this example is uh, you can excite multiple harmonics in your quartz crystal microbalance, and then you can do analysis and you will have two-dimensional plot for different vapors. Not three dimensions, not ten, two, okay? Not more. And then you can also look at the resistance change of your resonator and frequency shift, and you also will get at most two dimensions. Important aspect here is that, and that's one of the take-home messages, if possible, look at the raw response, if possible. If um, you really need to do multivariate analysis, then do it. 
the reason that you look at uh, raw responses because you have the ability then to see how the different noise sources are affecting your effect. Okay, so look at raw responses if possible. Here is an example of 2D dispersion where you have uh, uh, you do impedance measurements at different frequencies and uh, you can measure uh, ion resistance versus electron resistance at different frequencies. Again, you have a two-dimensional response. All these examples are individual papers, you don't mix them here. Okay, then two-dimensional response from uh, um, resistance versus a Z back coefficient or conductance versus surface work function. The reason that I keep on showing those examples because there are many nice examples of 2D response okay, of individual vapors. And if if your application is is uh, okay with the uh, 2D responses because not many interferences will come, that may be sufficient. You can also use uh, ligand functionalized. Uh, optical or plasmonic nanoparticles, you can spread these responses as a function of refractive index of your uh, material because you're looking at the whole plasmonic shape of, uh, of your uh, uh, absorbance. Uh, or uh, you can look also at uh, other um, properties of the volatiles that uh, are zealous for sure. So 2D responses. So 3D responses are not as many examples of individual vapors. That's with the, with the fact transistor, uh, when you're looking at uh, several outputs from such a transistor, such as uh, source drain current, mobility, threshold voltage. So depending on the different types of vapors, then this pattern is different. So that's why you have three dimensional dispersion of your individual sensor. So this is individual sensor. So you have more vapors, and uh, you have also three-dimensional dispersion here. And uh, with our uh, resonant structures, we have learned that we have different flavors of these resonant structures. Those are resistor, capacitor, inductor, resonators, LCR resonators. You see different flavors. And uh, uh, we have learned that uh, right and left portions of high and low frequency portions, they come from uh, uh, inductive reactants and capacitive reactants, when we look at multiple features of this resonance spectrum, then we're getting that multivariate juice and uh, multivariate uh, uh, performance. So from the uh, noise, uh, uh, short-term noise perspective, uh, our uh, approach is to drop a small polynomial fit, second-order polynomial fit, on our resonant response. And in this way, we're getting the performance for the noise features of our frequency position and the height position of our spectrum quite nicely. So if we are operating, let's say, at 50 megahertz, then our noise, short-term noise, this is 10 minutes, is uh, from here to here is uh, 10, 10, uh, 10 hertz. Okay? And, uh, here we are, from here to here is 0.01 ohm or so. So that helps us dramatically to get to uh, the good resolution. So from the previous segment, we know the more vapors you have, the better. Okay, the best. But look, look at this strange behavior. Not strange, but behavior that we see. So if we have that resonator, and we have two vapors as an, as an example, Okay. Then, this is toluene, and uh, I see the nitrile, so we are doing the measurements of increasing concentrations. These are the two replicates of each concentration. And you see that for frequency peak position, uh, they are in different directions because they have different electric constants, so that's why uh, their capacitance will be either that way or that way. Okay. That's important. But uh, that's how the peak shift is responding to these different vapors, okay? Because toluene is a low dielectric constant, so it will shift the response of our sensing field, who is at uh, about 5, to higher frequencies. And uh, the nitrile has a, a high dielectric constant, so it will push the response to, to the left, okay? 
So if we're looking at uh, different responses, then peak position was shifting, as I showed you on the previous slide. Peak height was showing that this response was about twice bigger than that one. And uh, uh, real, no, uh, resonant and anti-resonant frequencies of the imaging portion of the resonant impedance. You, you see that here the directions were different and the heights were about the same. And here the directions were the same, same and the height for this one or the magnitude was about three times larger. So we have learned that, hey, that's a pattern. And we can nicely discriminate that thing with the scores plot and uh, it's only two vapors, so the maximum PCs will be two. But you can see that you can nicely discriminate. So again, the interesting thing that even the <coughs> resonant and anti-resonant frequencies, that's F2 and F1, they have the different profiles here that help us in getting this dispersion quite nicely. So if we want to detect different volatiles with the same dielectric constant, right? Then we need to use the uh, special sensing material or more exotic one. And these are the peptide cap gold nanoparticles that uh, allowed us to push the responses to methyl salicylate and uh, dichloromethane in different directions, although they were having the very similar dielectric constants. So uh, you can also push the responses to different uh, volatiles like uh, these ones in three dimensions when you look at the raw responses of uh, frequency uh, shift versus frequency uh, with the versus peak height or calculated C versus R then they are not as pronounced nicely because you need to uh, probably out of scale them or mean center so that uh, the axis will be the same but you can get three dimensions from these types of vapors quite nicely. This is the same sensing material with a capacitor where unless I label these types of volatiles, you really don't see how you can discriminate between these types of volatiles. So three dimensions of uh, individual vapors here as well. Uh, also examples for uh, chemical uh, warfare agent uh, simulants and uh, um, 3D dispersion uh, of uh, uh, four vapors. Now we have more uh, three-dimensional dispersion here, and uh, if we want to discriminate closely related vapors such as these nine alcohols and water, then we see the pattern that we are analyzing with our principal components analysis. These are ten vapors with the four concentration each, and we are discriminating, discriminating them in uh, three dimensions. Here as well. So, if we're plotting the raw response versus another raw response, we're having about the same uh, graph as we're doing the principal components analysis. So, photonic sensors, they give us more dispersion as well. So, if we have uh, coarse shell photonic particles that we assemble, then we have the three dimensional dispersion for individual vapors. So four vapors give us this dispersion. So the reason that we go through these examples is just to see what is the state of achieving those dispersion. Can you get six or seven? I cannot. But I can get three or four, and if together we can see how we can get high dispersion with the new uh, approaches, then uh, we will win as the uh, sensor community. So for photonic structures, we have learned that if we use the structures that are multilayer interference structures, then we are getting the responses that are better than other types of sensors. And we started with natural structures, as I'm showing there. Then we started doing the uh, structures with our uh, lithography tools, and then now we're using them for high temperature applications. And the reason for that is that uh, when we have the preferential interactions of different papers with different regions of the structure, then that's how we're getting the different optical profiles and uh, are able to 
uh, discriminate between the different vectors. The signal changes are reasonably small, so that's why we're looking at the differential reflectance where we're normalizing the response to the sensor response without the analog. So two dimension, a three-dimensional response to uh, closely related vapors, as you see here, these are the spectra that we are analyzing using PCA, and uh, uh, we have learned that chemically and physically, it's because the different heights of this structure, they have different chemistry, and uh, that allows us to interact different vapors with different regions of this structure, and that's pronounced in the optical dimension. So from theory, we have shown that if we are forgetting that they are having the different chemical diversity, then we don't have the three-dimensional uh, response like this. But when we are uh, modeling the response uh, of uh, uh, chemical diversity, then we're getting the response uh, theoretically uh, similar to what we saw years ago uh, experimentally. So that work was done uh, what several years after that experiment. So it gives us a flavor on how to design these types of uh, sensors. And uh, with uh, nanofabrication tools, you can have the structures made in such a way that they will incorporate different chemistries, that's what we're doing, in order to get the uh, selectivity better and better. So, uh, example of four-dimensional response, this is 3D, this is the PC number four. So these are the results of analysis of this differential spectra of uh, different papers. And uh, another tool that um, we and others are using is a hierarchical cluster analysis where you also are able to discriminate these papers also related to their concentrations as well. So when we are comparing these responses with the responses that we saw of the dosimeters, then those were experimental data exposed to 19 gases, and uh, the dimensionality was uh, nine dimensions or so. And uh, our simulations are showing that if we have these structures and we're exposing them to only two gases, we're getting about the same or maybe even better dimensionality as well. So these are the individual papers. Uh, these are follow-up studies from different groups in uh, making the different photonic structures for those applications. So different excitation conditions or modulation okay, is uh, something that is uh, growing in more and more importance and I believe that this field shape should uh, take advantage of that. And, uh, Temperature modulation is one example where you have a polymer sensing material and you do the modulation of temperature from minus 20 degrees to about 70 degrees. And that's how with a single sensor, uh, material sits on the source structure. You are able to have your two-dimensional plot. Okay. And uh, when you modulate, that's a classic work uh, from uh, Steve Semancic and his team. And there are many other a nice uh, result where you modulate the temperature of a metal oxide semiconducting material sensor, then you're getting the 3D dispersion here as well. So that's a very encouraging result. So that's a three-dimensional dispersion. We saw this graph before, hours ago. And the reason that uh, we are so successful in thermal modulation here is because of this classic thing. Because here we are having the different mechanisms fitting in for different vapors at different temperatures, that's how we're getting this type of uh, resolution. You can uh, modulate, uh, you can work with the fact transistors do the temperature modulation or uh, do the different excitation conditions and uh, these are the two-dimensional examples. You can change the power of your integrated circuit chip and you can resolve different papers in this way as well. This is two-dimensional. And uh, uh, also you can modulate your guest flow in uh, 
sine wave, but you can make it faster and faster, and uh, you can differentiate between the different papers uh, depending on their recovery and uh, response time. These are the same experiments where you are measuring F1 response, which is um, the resonant property of the structure. This is anti-resonant uh, property of uh, your imaginary part of the uh, resonance. And you can see that depending on what feature you're looking at, the same gas has either slowing down the response time or the same response time. So it tells us that there are different mechanisms in this uh, sensing structure. So what about mixtures and uh, complicated examples? So we have learned how to push the responses to uh, in uh, mixtures to into different planes. And uh, this is coming from the fact that we and others were trying to have the response of our gas sensing materials with the smallest parts of the responses to to the gases that we are, we don't like. And uh, our philosophy here is different. We're allowing that response to interference to happen because we didn't win for years of research, we as a community. But we are allowing it into different plane of the response of our sensor. And in this way, if we're pushing the response to humidity in another plane, which is normal, or orthogonal to the plane of our response to analyte, then we don't care. We can reject up to 2 million. The important aspect of this sensing film is that they will not interact, the surface will not be saturated and with our interference, and that's why we're able to get the responses. Examples of uh, doing the measurements under variable humidity are shown here as well for chemical warfare agent simulants, and uh, uh, we are having the correlation plots uh, in predicting these concentrations of two analytes in, in the presence of different humidity levels. So I have what? Need to finish. I have got several more slides, guys. Uh, so these are examples of. Uh, mixtures with the humidity level. <coughs> These are examples of uh, quantitating different analytes mixed in binary mixtures, joinery and quaternary mixtures. And here the approach is to do classification first with one method, such as support vector machine, and then do quantitation with the uh, other type of method that uh, is shown uh, that uh, it, it helps in uh, doing this quantitation. And uh, also as a uh, uh, analysis of uh, different complex mixtures, we were using analysis of uh, different T's as, as model example because you can look at uh, different other types of volatiles and we had uh, several uh, seven T's here so we had the three dimensional response and uh, this is the fourth PC so up to four dimensions of the response of a single sensor like that and uh, we can add in the absence of the drift, this confusion matrix shows very nice prediction of uh, all the aromas when we are adding more and more drift synthetically just to see how stable we are. Then we are able to give that prediction ability quite nicely up to 20% of the added drift. We looked at other types of volatiles such as different uh, uh, spices and the uh, same we are able to discriminate them quite nicely and uh, even with the added risk. So these are the different types of uh, volatiles. So when we are adding the more and more interferences, we have that 12 channel system, so we can have a pattern of two va uh, va vapors, such as vapor one, Halloween, and other model vapor, like uh, 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 THF. Uh, so we are adding more and more interferences up to eight more, and uh, with uh, up to total 10 vapors, eight of them are interferences, we're able to have the correlation plots quite nicely reserved in the presence of more and more uncalibrated for interferences. That's because 
the combination of the sensing material and that resonant transducer was giving us that stability. With the optical sensors, we were also doing mixtures with the different vapors such as propanol, methanol, <coughs> and uh, adding more and more humidity levels. So these were the ternary mixtures. And you can see that optically at different colors, or different wavelengths, you have a different pattern of the response. So sometimes the response to first gas is bigger than the response to the second one. Sometimes they are quick, sometimes they are different pattern. The response to water vapor sometimes is very minimal or very significant. So these patterns, they give you the ability to discriminate between these types of volatiles and also to quantify them quite well. And uh, correlation plots of uh, predicted uh, values versus actual ones, they're shown here for different levels of uh, uh, moisture, and that's because uh, the design of the transducer was uh, uh, sufficient for, for these types of measurements. So we were comparing the response of that single multivariable sensor with the response of the quartz crystal microvalence sensor array and uh, also metal oxide sensor uh, sensor array uh, for responses to individual vapors in their mixtures. And we saw that individual multivariable sensor was uh, able to do measurements in a much more linear fashion than the sensor rates and uh, uh, was able to do much better discrimination. So that's comparison with the uh, conventional sensor rates. From the stability perspective, the work started in literature to do to understand how you can correct for stability effect if uh, you have the different types of baseline and uh, over a short period of time these are the responses to hydrogen these are three concentrations and uh, you see three uh, response cycles when you run for multiple response cycles then for many cycles 75 cycles then. yes so you can see that depending on the wavelength where you sit you, you have different uh, amounts of drift. And that helps you in uh, having your multivariate model that corrects for this drift no matter how much it is. The important aspect is that for this model, we're not looking at the whole data set. Okay? Because if we look at the whole data set, that becomes a classic design of experiments and so on. So we are learning what are the features in our multiple response are important when we are looking at the first two or three of those cycles and after that we are strong enough to predict the future as well. So that's an example of um, this correction and uh, without correction you see that uh, errors are quite significant with correction there are uh, ten times less. Uh, similar when you have mixtures of your analyzed <coughs> water interference, then you, this is the short-term response, and uh, in the presence of the drift, you correct for drift effects. <laughs> in the temperature corrections, this is the two-dimensional graph where you can correct for temperature effects uh, for a humidity sensor, and uh, I believe that ends the segment number three that concludes uh, this section just showing that the sensors can operate with the uh, individual vapors, their mixtures. We are not uh, as good as GC or mass spec. We are about three or four uh, dimensions of the dispersion. So I would say similar to the sensor rate. But because we have single uh, sensing material, then we showed in some, you see in some examples that we correct for drift effects. I would say um, in the fashion that we saw, so we have a hope that this uh, uh, drift can be corrected in the uh, future as well. So I will finish with that couple of slides from section four.
because now you see where it can go. If you're happy, I'm happy. If you're disappointed, I'm also happy because this is the state of what can be done with the sensor arrays, with individual sensors, with the multivariable sensors, and those all the four patterns, they kind of tell me, hey, those things were invented to do the measurements at high concentrations and uh, with um, known guesses. So we as a community, I think we have a lot of ideas that you saw to bring these sensors to the new level. Okay. So we anticipate, we as a you know academic and industrial researcher, so we anticipate what next. Okay. If somebody doesn't need something, but we anticipate that it will be important, then we focus on that. And um, uh, you saw that uh, we are trying to be as good as sensor rays and more stable as sensor rays in, in, uh, uh, over time. Okay, and uh, these are the examples of those multivariable sensors. Uh, right now, we are showed examples of uh, five and up to ten analytes. So maybe in future we will be at some hundreds with our multivariable sensors. But now we are at uh, around ten. Okay, then. Uh, in order to move that research to higher levels, we need to talk more and more to people who need to give us their feedback on what is exactly needed, for how long, what type of extractive things we can get, and that's how we move into more and more advanced uh, designs. And it takes some time and it takes some money, as uh, George Whiteside was uh, telling us, and uh, uh, in the US and I think in other countries, so these developments are known as technology readiness levels. And uh, in the lab, we start with low TRLs, and we do proof of concept, lab validation, field, and uh, finally into the product. There are ma many, uh, several other technology progress metrics, those readiness levels. They are manufacturing readiness levels, data readiness system, commercial readiness levels. So it's very interesting to see what are those levels. They are very important for different phases. And uh, from the roadmap of, uh, of uh, where the sensors are going. So no matter if they are arrays or individual sensors or multivariable, so the drivers are targets, uh, system performance targets, market drivers, product drivers. So there are a lot of drivers for us to choose where to go. And, uh, if we see where it goes, you know, in uh, 2060 or so, then there are a lot of things ranging from materials designs, transducers, excitation conditions, and uh, a lot of uh, data analysis that um, uh, I hope will, will come solutions uh, it needs data. And uh, I'll finish with this one because um, I saw this cage without the bird. Uh, at some DARPA meeting, and uh, I decided that it's uh, something that we invented uh, some time ago, new and new, new sensors, so we're the part of community who will make even better sensors now, okay? Thank you, guys.